briefer expositions. On rereading one of Anatoly France's meditative books, such as the Jardin d'Epicure, one cannot help feeling, despite gratitude for enlightenment dispensed, an uneasiness that is sufficiently explained neither by the old-fashioned pose so eagerly adopted by renegade French irrationalists, nor by the personal vanity. But when this latter serves as a pretext for envy, all intellect necessarily revealing a moment of vanity as soon as it represents itself, the reason for the uneasiness becomes clear. It stems from the contemplative leisureliness, the sermonizing, however sporadic, the indulgently raised forefinger. The critical content of the thought is bellied by that air of having all the time in the world, familiar from professional pillars of the status quo, oh sorry, familiar from the from professorial pillars of the status quo, and the irony with which this impersonator of Voltaire admits on his title pages to membership of the Académie Française rebounds on its witty author. His mode of delivery contains, beneath the poised humanity, a hidden violence. He can afford to talk in this way because no one interrupts the master. The element of usurpation inherent in all holding forth, and even in all reading aloud, has seeped into the lucid construction of his periods, which reserve so much repose for the most disquieting things. The unmistakable sign of latent contempt for mankind in this last advocate of human dignity is the imperturbable enunciation of platitudes, as if no one may dare to notice their triteness. L'artiste doit aimer la vie et nous montrer qu'elle est belle. Sans lui, nous en douterions. Oh, translated. The artist ought to love life and show us that it is beautiful. Without him, we should doubt it. But what is so obtrusive in France's archaically stylized meditations is more subtly present in any reflection that claims exemption from immediate purposes. Serenity is becoming, as such, the same lie that purposive haste already is. While the thought in terms of its content may oppose the irresistibly rising tide of horror, the nerves, the sensitive feelers of historical consciousness detect in its form indeed in its very willingness still to be a thought, a trace of connivance at the world to which a concession has already been made the moment one steps back sufficiently from it to make it an object of philosophy. In the detachment necessary to all thought is flaunted the privilege that permits immunity. The aversion aroused by this is now the most serious obstacle to theory. If one gives way to it, one keeps quiet. If not, one is, co one is coarsened and debased by confiding in one's own culture. Even the odious division of talk into professional conversations and strictly conventional ones hints at our sense of the impossibility of uttering thoughts without arrogance, without trespassing on the time of others. The most urgent need of exposition, if it is to be in the least serviceable, is to keep such experiences always in view, and by its tempo, compactness, density, yet also its tentativeness to give them expression.